holistically when you look at our business we have you know great games that keep people playing for a long time that add value um and then if you plug in the operator into the side of that it actually then says and these convert really really well so we used ai very much as a an r d tool and we focused actually on some really interesting things which was how could we use an ai tool to help predict what to serve to our customers it's brand specific and deal specific um, for how that data ownership goes. Yeah, and I have a you know, Brad Marchand Pepsi cup that was sent to me for all my votes there you for go. Brad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From him personally. Yeah. Hello, welcome to another episode of Sports Betting Conversations. Today we're joined by Jamie Mitchell, CEO at Low6. Uh, Jamie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi guys, um, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to the, uh, to the podcast. Um, yeah, Jamie Mitchell, CEO of Low6, um, co-founder of the business, uh, started um, four or five years ago now. Um, effectively, uh, it was born out of um, an idea that gamification could harness big data for players, um, for users of those sort of games, those free-to-play games that we were looking to pro uh, sort of provide. Uh, myself and uh, my co-founder Wayne uh, very much believed that you know if we were looking to work with franchises, rights holders, etc. across the globe, that actually their call to action, um, if we built a platform that could sit under their brand, uh, would be very powerful. So they could harness the the sort of power of free to play. We could absolutely curate the data for them uh, with a view that they could that monetize that data. So that was the sort of premise of of Low Six, if you like, very much using the power of data. Uh, to monetize uh, and then personally my background was i had a corporate career in uh, british telecom which is a big sort of the biggest telecoms company over in the uk i was working in the sports division of that that particular organization for some time um so i had access to you know lots of rights holders um specifically across the uk so very much felt there was a uh, an embryonic idea there that could be built out and um you know very much had an interest in in technology so that's kind of how it all all began really Excellent. And, um, you know, about Low6, uh, you know, we spoke previously, you mentioned some exciting things you're doing with uh, uh, some uh, high profile professional sports leagues. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So basically, I guess our journey very much um, sort of, as I said, focused around the idea that we could help rights holders um, acquire and monetize um, users and data. And that really coincided um, with sports betting becoming legal in North America, so the PASPA repeal. Uh, so we sort of saw this idea that that could be quite exciting for the organizations that we worked with. So we were quick to pen deals with the likes of the PGA Tour, the UFC. Uh, we worked with various rights holders, um, such as the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, Detroit Pistons, Sacramento Kings. Uh, and then more recently, we signed a, a long term uh, partnership with the National Hockey League. So we're the official free to play provider of the National Hockey League. So very much working across those rights holders to provide free to play, um, to engage an audience, um, to help those organizations um, ultimately monetize that audience, be it through iGaming or, you know, subsequently, if it's not the iGaming space, there's always this want to monetize via ticket sales, merchandise, etc., um, some of the work we then did with these guys very much caught the attention of the iGaming operators directly. So then we started to work directly with iGaming operators to build their free-to-play games as well. So um, we work with the likes of Flutter, Entain, um, to name you know just a couple of the, the sort of organisations. And I suppose really the the premise of of what we do hasn't really changed uh, hugely uh, in terms of that you know build a really fun game that lots of people would like to play, um, start to understand what the audience is looking for, um, and then start to to scale that out really um, and capture all that data that we spoke about and um, yeah really start to to sort of see how if it's an iGaming partner how does that convert into iGaming from free to play and if it's a brand how do you convert that data as I say into other monetizable events such as merchandise ticket sales etc so the, uh, the the free to play strategy is is different right depending on you know who, who you're working with so it must be quite a challenge when you're developing games because uh like you said for the sports books it's one thing for the team for teams and leagues it's a completely different 
objective. Yeah, completely. And I think I think actually that's where we we think we have somewhat of a competitive advantage, a competitive advantage over some of our peer group that sit in the sort of same free to play space because we don't get totally hung up on conversion into a sports gambler, if that makes sense. And so the only metric we measure is do they convert from free to play into gambling, and mm -hmm. you know, vice versa. We when we build engaging games for a franchise that's not looking to convert to sports wagering um you know it's all about engagement dwell time how fun is this game to play how long can we keep the player coming back and how much value do we add to that player rather than you know just looking to convert them over to a sort of iGaming gaming operator so holistically when you look at our business we have you know, great games that keep people playing for a long time that add value. Um, and then if you plug in the operator into the side of that, it actually then says, and these convert really, really well as well. So we have a you know data science team in our business that all they focus on is where the dropouts are, where the exciting points of our game are, how do we refine that and how do we keep people coming back? So I think it's a really nice blend for us. Um, we also work with some media organisations as well. So some of our games with the PGA Tour were on broadcast by NBC, for example. And then you have another challenge, you know, how do you actually take a mass audience and build a game that has mass appeal, not very niche um, to one specific sector? So I think we've face all those kind of challenges in the history of the business and um but as i say when you when you reflect back on the learnings and the data um it all sort of leads you to a really nice holistic point where you can say actually we're very good at all of these subsections and and that's why we we think we do so well in the in the industries um and in the verticals that you know in which we work i yeah i like what you're doing with the nhl um obviously i'm a a, a huge hockey fan so i i get in the rabbit hole of playing your games yeah. uh, from winter classic to voting for the all-stars. The Bruins get a lot of my votes. Um, but what I noticed in particular is the brand uh, involvement. You have Pepsi of Geico and stuff. Yeah. So were those conversations, if I'm a, if I'm at the NHL, I, I like that the NHL did this versus an individual team. Cause now they can, they're leveraging all their teams and their brand. So are they having conversations with the Pepsis, the Hondas, all their major sponsors and bringing you in and saying, let's create a special game for the brands or how's that work? Yeah, exactly right. I think, I think sponsorship in general, we've seen change with the major organizations over the last few years. So the days of, you know, the likes of a drinks brand, just walking up to a, 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 a business such as the NHL and saying, you know, here's $10 million, just put us all over the, the LED right. boards and on the back of the players' jerseys. It's just moved on so far from that that it's almost essential now for a for a federation or a league to almost add more value and say, actually, how about we, you know, we engage the audience right. with um Pepsi goalie challenge is a great example where you drag yeah. a can of Pepsi onto a goalie that you think will have a shutout that evening. So, you know, people start to resonate with the brand. And then also the subsection of all of that is that actually then you have tens of thousands of users. Um, who have consented to marketing, for example, from Pepsi in the future, which is a, a massive step forward from the untangible sort of dollars that you would spend on just a huge advertising board in the, in the past. And so I think it's almost a necessity now um, for people to have these engagement tools that actually do resonate with, you know, different audiences, be it millennials, Gen Zs, whatever it might be, and then to have a tangible result at the end, which is, data that you can market to and data that has lots of points around it to say, you know, Kevin's picked um, Brad Marsh on 20 times in his pick em, for example, it wouldn't it be reasonable to think that that's his favorite player from the Bruins. Right. Right. And who owns that data? Does the NHL own the data and then share it with Pepsi or does Pepsi want to own that data? If it's their game, how's that, how does that data it's share all, work? Yeah. It's all, all depends all specifics um change from game to game so uh depends what deals have been done you know okay. but it always comes back down to the user has to physically opt in to say you know yes right. I'm, I'm prepared to share my data with that organization that organization. and if they don't want to that's absolutely fine as well because we you know no one wants to market to somebody who doesn't want to be marketed to so yeah it's it's brand specific and deal specific um for how that data ownership goes yeah, and I have a you know, Brad Marchand Pepsi cup that was sent to me. 
for all my votes there you for go. Brad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from him personally. <laughs> yeah. And, and what about the lo- what yes, what about the localization? Uh, you know, as as I watch the Bruins up in Nessa yeah. and they they do a lot of lo- they they have a lot of games. Do you extend in the NA? Let's just stay on the NHL for a minute. Do you extend to the teams the way you do in the other leagues, or is it is the, the league manage all the relationships? Yeah, we typically we deal with the the league uh, as a central point, um, but we do do lots of localization throughout the games. Actually, so if you look at a Canadian sports betting brand called Bet Ninety Nine, um, Bet Ninety Nine, mm-hmm. uh, you know, really forward thinking innovative eye gaming operator that really want to specialize in hockey it's their shtick if that's not right. too much of a pun um and you know we we localize those games to canada for bet 99 then if you were to move into america we have a different brand localized um for the north american sort of america um side of that pickums for example so yeah there's there's a there's a whole heap of localization and then with some of the other brands particularly in the uk and um, we get hyper local so postcode specific you know around which team we might market to etc cetera, etc cetera. so um i think the the ethos in our business has always been right message, right person, right time. And, you know, a good example of the wrong message is sending a Tottenham Hotspurs fan, you know, an Arsenal promotion uh, just because they, you know, they happen to be in North London. So um, it's it's incredibly important. And that's how things, I think, have moved forward so much in technology. You know, you, you, you expect to get the right message these days on the right device um, at the right time. And if you don't, you disregard it typically as spam you know so it's it's super important that these organizations understand their audience and that's where the big changes come I, I personally believe in the last certainly three or four years they're really brands are really understanding and, and franchises that they have to be super specific um and not be seen as just another spam kind of marketer to that individual and what you talk about individual how does it break down between individual and like community, like games that are people are joining yeah. and sharing? Like, you know, is there what wins the day? Is the do people want to be part of a, a a group like the fantasy type thing? Like, I'm in the NFL fantasy on DraftKings yeah. every week. You know, is that really popular? Or do people like yeah. to stay in their own silo? No, I mean community wins every time. Okay, really. that's and, great. Um, you know, we we have a couple of games in our sort of portfolio that are a hybrid, if you like, from daily fantasy into a pick'em. And when we really knew we had sort of hit, I say, product market fit, probably is the right way to describe it, was when Discord communities were popping up organically around these games, and tens of thousands of people start to join these Discord communities to chat about what their picks are, who their favorite players are, what the forecast for this week. Once you hit that, I think it's like hitting gold basically for the, the the operator, the brand, because it is this organic thing that people get so passionate about. You know, they almost, we notice customer service is always, you know, prevalent in any business that does gamification. You'll always have customer service issues from people who say, I press that button before the pick started and saying I didn't all the way through to, you know, this player's not showing injured. These Discord communities were almost self-regulating customer service for us. They're like, yeah, you're being an idiot. You just need to go and press that button. And when you get to that part, that's utopia for for a business like ours because it, it just shows the passion and the virality of these products. And that particular game was called Ultimate Fan. um, And it went to number one in the UK app store. It went to top grossing app in the app store. It was, you know, on its own. It just started to grow arms and legs because of how good the game was. And it really, I mean, it's so exciting when you get a product that starts to to take off like that. And it had a K factor of two and, you know, it's just very, very exciting. And that's what everybody's searching for ultimately is that kind of virality and that community that sits around it for sure. So in our games, we started to do friends leaderboards, social sharing, which you'll see on the NHL. So all-star fan vote um, last year, you would have seen, you know, you could share all of your picks on a screenshot out to Instagram and all those kind of things. They all seem quite standard now. Um, but you know that's the leap forward in the last couple of years um, being able to invite your friends into private leagues and whatsapp chats and it will just get bigger and bigger i think the community angle in in what everybody's doing gamification wise for sure yeah and is the community um better handled within the apps themselves or on platforms like discord or telegram or whatever 
folks We've, prefer to we, use? It's a really good question, actually. It's so much more organically off, better off platform and to let them sort of manage that themselves. Um, mm. it, it's almost that uh, that authoritative, oh, it's one of the companies trying to get involved right. now and answer right. the question. They, these guys just love to do it themselves and they assign themselves moderators and all sorts of mm -hmm. things. And as I say, you can either fight against that or you can just embrace it and say amazing. So one of our, that particular game, we launched it with um, a North American iGaming company called Rivalry. They do heaps of esports um, side of things. Really exciting company. We launched um, in the Philippines for them with an NBA game and immediately Discord channel popped up again, you know, with people wanting to trade these different player cards with each other. Again, just shows for an iGaming company to have a Discord channel that's, you know, organically popped up is is very, very good. Um, and, yeah, super exciting. Yeah, I mean, there's... A, it, it's a yeah, I totally understand like why people would prefer like not to do it under the hood of the uh, the app itself. Um, is there a way or a method um, for, uh, let's say, um, you to um, get involved in, in those like Discord communities? Just because it will help you from a strategy perspective to see what people are talking about and um also help them as well right um, well we, we we actually yeah we decided to do that so we kind of asked the community would you mind actually if we came and uh, every week we ran a competition inside of your discord um and the competition would be to win extra coins to play in this particular game for example um and so yeah we we actually do get involved we we we, we try and be as hands off as we can but if there's a question that needs answering you know it can be sort of directed towards us but then again we try and gamify the the discord by as i say having weekly competitions that can then be rewarded inside the game etc just to let people know that that we're there and we understand it and actually for our own business um you know the age profile of our employees is kind of you know mid to late 20s um is probably the the sort of and maybe early 30s i i skew it somewhat these days the the medium age but um yeah so these guys and girls are super confident and and understand twitch discord etc so well that you know they're happy to be in there and, and taking part and uh, again i sort of chatting to you guys before it's just things have moved forward so quickly in the last mm -hmm. sort of five or six years that it's it's almost <laughs> um yeah, it's almost normal, isn't it, now to have a, a sort of Discord and a Twitch and all these sort of things that surround these games. Uh, and uh, I, I hadn't seen it before, so it was it was new to me. Yeah, interesting. And uh, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot obviously going on with with each app, <clears throat> right? And you mentioned you know scaling, and um, you know one of one of the uh, topics that are you know kind of uh, hot at the moment is is AI. Um, are you doing anything with AI to help you scale or have it, I guess, leverage it to come up with certain strategies, strategies or, or ideas? Yeah, I mean, it's just for us, uh, you know, we moved from startup to scale up um, in the last sort of 18 months, pretty significantly going from, you know, a few, a few thousand users typically, to over a million users on the platform. And uh, one of the big sort of tech moves forward that we saw and we, we leapt on pretty quickly was obviously AI, like almost everybody else. We very much took a, a different approach to AI. We used it as an R&D tool in our business. So we, we, we weren't sure and we were, I suppose, in some ways, um, you know, fearful that we didn't want to embed something that we didn't know if we could um, cope without if it was taken away or the pricing strategy was vastly different to what we might think it would be. So we used AI very much as a an R&D tool and we focused actually on some really interesting things, which was how could we use an AI tool to help predict what to serve to our customers? So I talked about Arsenal and Tottenham um, as, a, as an example earlier, two yeah. rivals in North London in soccer. Um, <clears throat> And what we wanted to do was use AI to show on the previous entries, um, et cetera, et cetera, should we serve an Arsenal or a Tottenham question to that particular user? I'm just using those two as, as, as my example. Um, and it helped us hone 
the personalization of each one of our games to each one of our users so that we ensured that we got the right message, right person, right time more often than we did previously. And it helped us make huge advantages forward with analyzing data in almost real time. Whereas before, you know, we we had data scientists, if you like, pulling together dashboards, et cetera. AI for us just managed to take that uh, automate the process and then feed it back into our sort of SaaS type platform and feed that content out in real time. So for us, it's been incredibly empowering. I, you know, it's been super exciting for us. And then we did a piece of R and D work for an iGaming operator where we built an AI safer gambling tool, um, which started to prompt you if you were betting outside of your normal. Uh, patterns, if you like, different times of the day, would try and detect if you were intoxicated by your spelling, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these were just different AI tools that we, we were spinning up, testing, learning, um, you know, and some of them will roll out in time and others we won't. But for us, it's it's now, you know, a, a core part of our backbone um, and one that we're, I think we're barely scratching the surface on, if I'm honest, but like many businesses, um, it's just where, where it will land in the given the fullness of time, I think. Yeah, it's kind of funny if the you can identify the instead of the drunk dialer, the the, the drunk you know gambler or it gamer. Really, it was really interesting. So we, uh, you know, I we were writing this um, this. It's kind of like a betting widget. We called it BetBud, uh, and it sits on the bottom of your screen uh, as you're playing whatever you're playing on casino or whatever, and it starts to monitor your your patterns. It then uh, effectively compares them to previous patterns of play. It will then assess the time. Then it will start to look at, well, you know, perhaps it's 10 past nine on a Friday night. Has Jamie had a bottle of Chateau Neuve de Pap? And should we sort of say you'd be better coming back at Saturday, you know, morning at 11 till four, because that's when you have your most product productive times, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's just those kind of uh, natural interventions it can make. And, um, you know, without feeling like it was just a messenger type right. bot of the past. And I think that's, I said it before, I think it'll be the biggest um, leap forward for safer gambling, actually. I think AI will be that conduit to to a much um, more holistically sound sort of safer gambling type tool um, than, than has ever been created before. Yeah, if I was ever voting for a Canadian, you'd know I was drunk. Um, it's, yeah. Um, the, um, but when you talk about some of these events and, and you know, Coming off a Super Bowl, Big Ten Bowl event, now you're in March Madness, we've got Olympics. How do you approach like the bracket world for March Madness or big, big Ten Bowl events, you know, like as far as scale? Like if you had mm. a game that just just went off the Richter, you know, because every college kid in America was on your game. How do you in the back end uh, are prepared for something like that? Yeah, it was, was one of our biggest learnings last year, really. I mean, we we – you know, if we take the NHL, for example, I, I didn't appreciate how big all-star fan vote was. Um, oh, yeah. uh, you know, quite literally, can't give specific numbers, but quite literally tens of millions of votes uh, on our platform. You know, that kind of traffic Actually. is is very unusual. Um, and so we really, really had to work on our, our DevOps side of our business. And, and again, invest in the sort of auto-scaling, predicted scaling type Azure setup that we moved to uh, in preparation. And then it's, you know, as I spoke about before, moving from a startup to a scale up technologically, underestimating that is at your peril. But then on the flip side, unless you've got product market fit customers that sort of demonstrate you need to, you know, it's that right. sort of when do you make the jump from, right, I think we now need to get to this point. And you never want to be in a position where your customers are the ones saying to you, you know, people are taking 10 seconds to go on our platform because there's a spinning wheel. So I think having a really good relationship with your either your in-house technology team, your external um, sort of technology team, your hybrid team is essential. Communication was really good. And then having some really good, senior technologists in your business that understand and have been through this before. And that's really what we leaned on quite heavily was our internal leads that said, look, we've done this before in a, in an e-commerce world or a, you know, whatever it might be. Right. Let's take you through it. And then trusting the process. And, you know, I'm, I, I very much would say I'm a beginning, a beginner technology um, type advocate. If you like, I, I know a certain level, 
letting go of the reins and letting the experts sort of really guide you through that becomes essential, I think, for a sort of startup into scale up, unless you are a super techie sort of founder, which, you know, there are many of. Yeah. Yeah, because we've yeah. seen many a system crash for Super Bowl commercials, Super Bowl this. You know, I can see I March know. Madness being something like that. You know, Data Art, we have a lot of experience in the music business. You know, you have a hit song that could, you know, go globally. You know, there's billions and billions and billions of spins like overnight. You know, everybody's got to be ready. You know, totally. and, you know, you're absolutely right. And and even the small things, right? Like talking to your partners about when they're adverts are going out on primetime right. tv we did winter classic as you know for nhl and you know those those are qr codes that go out on every tv in the country who's watching nhl for example just having right. that level of comms to know when things are going how they're going you know what's the expected traffic is it prime time all of that you know just needs thinking about and i think that's probably where um you know the, the newer startups perhaps don't you know, get into that full scale end to end right. thought process. You just scale up the server and hope for the best. But actually, there's yeah. there's a whole load of stuff that has to go on in the background before. Um, but some of that comes with experience. We've you know we've had some some bad experiences in the past. Like every startup has, I'm sure. And um, you know, it's as I say, I think the conversation just has to keep flowing around your business, and you get better and better at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been. Great, Jamie. I mean, thank you so much, you know, for your time. Uh, you know, I think this was a wealth of <laughs> interesting information, and you know, we, we certainly appreciate it. No pleasure, yeah. and uh, thanks very much to to you both for inviting me on. As I say, and um, yeah, look forward to catching up again soon. Excellent. Yeah, for sure, we'll we'll have thank you back you. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was great. I got to go back to my games that I've been stuck on here with my NHL app. I'm just going to check your data out, actually. And see what your, who your favorite player is. Don't, don't check on me on a Friday night. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.